welcome to the program. Now, the military regimes in Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger have announced their immediate withdrawal from the West African bloc, ECOWAS. The leaders of the three Sahel nations in a statement said it was, quote, a sovereign decision to leave the economic community of West African states without delay. The three countries have had a frosty relationship with ECOWAS since the coup took place in Niger last July, Burkina Faso in 2022 and Mali in 2020. All three countries were suspended from ECOWAS with Niger and Mali facing heavy sanctions. Now, the withdrawal of the French military from the Sahel region along the Sahara Desert has heightened concerns over the conflict spreading southwards to the Gulf of Guinea, especially states like Ghana, Togo, Benin, and Ivory Coast. The sudden withdrawal of membership from the bloc is being predicted to have negative effects on the region. Well, to better understand the implications of this exit, I'm joined now in the studio by Professor Jibren Ibrahim, who's the senior fellow at the prestigious Center for Democracy and Development. Uh, thank you so much, Prof, for joining us. And then of thank you. Of course, we also have uh, Professor Gideon Fadibe, who's a professor of political science at the Nasara State University, joining us. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen, for uh, joining us here at Arise News. Uh, professor Jibrin, let's talk about how consequential this decision is for ECOWAS. I mean, it's 49 years since it was set up uh, in 1975. And then, of course, right here in Nigeria, in Lagos, by uh, then uh, military head of state, Yakubu Gawan. Uh, ECOWAS will be 50 next year. How hard is this blow to ECOWAS? Well, it's a very, very heavy blow for ECOWAS, which, as you recall, had 16 members until Mauritania left over two decades ago. When Mauritania left, it followed the treaty conditions which say you cannot just walk out of the organization. You must give one year notice. This time around, they are not even given any notice and want it with immediate effect. When you look at the map of uh, West Africa without those three countries, <laughs> it essentially <laughs> becomes the coastal states mm. and completely changes the dynamics of the region. So I think it's a serious blow and uh, we have to be very careful as a region how we address this crisis to make sure it doesn't blow out of proportion and the risk of his blowing out of proportion are very very high indeed and uh, professor gdf db let's talk about how uh in terms of landmass these uh, three countries actually have very huge landmass and uh, that will actually affect the sort of security situation that we have considering the sahelian crisis we've been managing since 2003. talk to us about uh Niger having about 1.26 uh, million uh, square meters, and then of course that of Mali about 1.24 million, and then of course Burkina Faso just about 230,000 or so. Combined, this almost looks like a subcontinent on its own. For these three countries to be pulling out of ECOWAS, how can leaders like President Tinubu manage this crisis since Nigeria is chairing ECOWAS? Well, thank you very much, uh, Sambo. Let me just say that I see this slightly differently. For me, it is um, a sign of the failure of deterrence. In international relations, we have what we call deterrence. And in deterrence theory, it's, you can simply say it's the use of your power to hurt as a bargaining chip. And you have to underline the word hurt, power to hurt and bargaining chip. So when ECOWAS started by, okay, we can say that for you, for deterrence to be effective, it must be credible. So for example, if you're little Gambia, you cannot go and uh, tell US all options will be on the table. And what is the essence of deterrence? It is to dissuade an adversary from starting a course of action, which you don't like, or continue that which I have asked to stop. Now, ECOWAS did not do, in my own opinion, it would have taken a different you know, um, option. You just gave one week notice, you must hand over power. And 
the idea that it has to be credible, you don't have anything to implement your threat, which means it's not credible. And uh, in that deterrence, he says, the use of your power to hurt, where is that power to hurt? As a bargaining chip. You don't use it, because once you use it, it's no longer deterrence. So you use that power to hurt by, in fact, once you employ deterrence, you want to conjure in the image of the person the possibilities of your hitting that person or that country or entity where yeah, it will hurt where most. Mm. So in the case, ECOWAS did not have that. And you went ahead and gave one week ultimatum. Not just that you went in and you played all your last card, all your cards, I implemented sanctions, no fly zone. So there's nothing again for you. They have seen the worst. Now the table has now turned. They have the aces now. But suddenly now you are saying we want to go and, and, and negotiate with them. What they were the ones before, you know, they were the ones that uh, appealing you, for that uh, negotiation. Yeah, so not necessarily window, appealing for window the of they, hey, you, they have now something to leverage. So now they can say, look, if you don't, if you don't want to relieve sanctions, we will go. So in essence, uh, ECOWAS has lost face. The diplomacy failed. That deterrence, use of deterrence as a bargaining chip also failed. So I think it was a learning chip. Tinubu was new in office, he needed to establish his tribe, he needed to establish, he was a young, you know, he could take effective decision. But I think we made, there, there was a, we had some strategic mistakes on the part of ECOWAS. How yeah, do we right. go now to reconfigure it? That would be the question. Yeah, and Prof, I would like to ha actually have your views on that. <laughs> How has uh, President Tinubu managed this situation? I mean, because the essence of handing over the chairmanship to him, according to ECOWAS officials, was that he was coming at a time when the regional bloc was in a uh, full-fledged crisis. I think it's important to look at this problem comprehensively. There were four errors of judgment that occurred. And he has listed one, that of ECOWAS and the failure of its deterrence. But before that error, the military in these three countries, for when you add Guinea, made a strategic blunder by breaking out of a normative framework collectively developed by all the 15 countries in Europe to maintain a constitutional and democratic regime. And that's what provoked the whole crisis yeah. in the first place. The second error is the one he has uh, uh, mentioned. The third error is these three countries are all landlocked. They are all having serious problems combating terrorism. And they've now decided to open a third front of confrontation. As you know, the basis of living ECOWAS is because Morocco has offered them access to the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, yeah. Now, Morocco is offering them access to the Atlantic Ocean so as to frustrate Algeria. Algeria is extremely powerful in that zone and has close ties with terrorist groups operating in all the three countries that can now be activated. So they, w they are now creating a situation where they have crisis to their south, crisis to their north, east, and west. They can't afford that. The fourth error is they are saying they will withdraw from ECOWAS. All these three landlocked countries depend on their neighbors for economic activities engaged by their economic migrants a lot of whom travel each year to these countries. In addition to that, their food comes from the same ECOWAS they are saying they are, they are living. The drugs they use in their health system, the, the electricity some of them use. So they are actually shooting themselves in the food. So there are four series of errors that are being connected. And I think at the end of the day, the important thing is to now stay calm, review the situation, put diplomacy back on the table, and look for ways of each one 
withdrawing from the errors they have committed so that the region can move forward. Yeah, but they don't see it that way. I mean, they've gone ahead to actually form their own regional bloc called the Alliance of Sahel States. And <laughs> they think, uh, sorry, let me just... But that's an alliance of uh, <laughs> poor Sahelian landlocked countries. Backed by the, Russia. The, Backed the, by the, Russia, because that's the, where yes, they seem to Russia be. but Russia is support. itself in a war and doesn't have the troops to support them in an extensive uh, war, ex especially now that they are adding Algeria to the list of enemies that have to be defeated. So I'm saying they are also buying more than they can chew. Okay. And they should <laughs> come down and come back to the negotiating table. Uh, well, right, yeah, I, I, wanted I, to I agree uh, largely with uh, what Prof said. But uh, it's not just one side has been weakened. If you look at after this uh, continental free trade, when they leave, as you're, not just landmarks that is being you know, shrunk, there are eight members, French-speaking members, in ECOWAS. And three have, have said they've withdrawn. They haven't, you know, they, they, we don't know what next, whether it is a bargaining, you know, cheap, whether it's supposed to give them a leverage to bargain. The, the, the feeling is that the other, at least two, three other French members of ECOWAS may be sympathetic. And if they move, if they decide, that they, as you know, there were a time they, there was a big pressure from France that they should find, you know, have their own alternative group instead of ECOWAS. They, yeah. For a long time, they worked against yeah. ECOWAS. Now, if they activate that, ECOWAS is that. And uh, if you look at the whole concept of AFTA, it's supposed to be rest on the four regional pillars. Each region will be strong and then you bring all of them to, 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 to the continental body. Now, it's not just one side. What I'm trying to say is that now they have got an ace. They can name bargain. It's no longer going to you throw, you do this and do that. It's now you have to negotiate. And they, you can't humiliate them anymore. Yeah, and, and they actually pointed out a very strategic situation in ECOWAS. They say yeah. ECOWAS is a lame duck that has yeah. gone away from, its, from the vision of its founding fathers. And that it's now a lame duck of the West. Uh, do you agree with this? Uh, Not necessarily. States, uh, yeah, you know, we don't know really where propaganda stops, where reality starts in all this. For example, the Pacific, Yeah, but in your own assessment, the, the, well, the do you Pacific, think ECOWAS is living up to its Yeah, because the, the feeling for people, years the after. People, people, the, the feeling people have is that the anti French sentiments that the, the, the coupists are playing on is very popular with the people on the streets. So if that is so, and it said that means that, uh, you know, ECOWAS is anti-people, that the ECOWAS position is not reflecting, you know, the, the sentiments on the street. And also there are some contradictions within the ECOWAS body itself. There are three categories of cues, and I'm, uh, Prof mentioned it in one of his write-ups, which I agree with. It's not just military cue. You have electoral cue, and you have constitutional cues. Many of them are also guilty of the other types of cues. And then you're haranguing one person because of one, one level of cue. So is either a perception that ECOWAS is out of touch because the sentiment of the people in these countries is with the copists. So if that is so, then you are talking about, you know, ECOWAS of people rather than of heads yeah, of states. Yeah, ECOWAS of heads of states. Well, I don't know if you actually um, would like to add one or two things about that. The, the, the reaction by these three states saying actually that the ECOWAS as an organization has deviated from uh, the vision of its founding fathers and it's a lame duck of the West. I think my view is that they are involved in intense propaganda against ECOWAS. Mm -hmm. Their main argument is that ECOWAS is being controlled by France and they, in the name of liberation from imperialism and colonialism, are fighting France. It's very interesting to look at their current move because there's UMOA, which yeah. is the organization of the eight Francophone countries, yeah. controlled by France, controlled by Côte d'Ivoire, by Senegal that are all pro-French. They have not withdrawn from UMOA, so they, are, they opted to remain under the French control organization and are now attacking Nigeria as being the foreign controlled power that has led to the decline of ECOWAS. That's propaganda. I think we should be careful what we take on. 
Yeah, but also there's this allegation against these three states of trying to run away from return to democracy. How, in your own assessment, do you think this move is? Could it be a subtle way of actually saying that, look, we are not prepared for uh, a, a democratic rule in the next three to four or five years? That's why we're pulling out from an organization that could pressure us to return to democracy. No, that's the real story. Uh, as you recall, when they went to the Russia-Africa summit, they, these uh, three military leaders in their speeches were very critical of democracy. The democracy doesn't work for Africa. They also raised the same issues at the United Nations uh, when they went there. So their own position is essentially military is back, the future is military rule. Mm. That's why Mali, for instance, that ECOWAS negotiated with and it agreed on a program of transition to democratic rule has now withdrawn from that uh, accord and has said uh, they are putting aside the transition for now they will continue with uh, military rule. So clearly the core problem is that these soldiers have come into power, they are enjoying power, they don't want to leave and they have decided to make democracy the enemy and that's why when, we, when I was making my general statement I said I think the diplomacy of ECOWAS uh, was wrong, but it, the core problem is the decision by these uh, soldiers in these uh, three or four countries to withdraw from the uh, general agreement in ECOWAS and in West Africa to maintain a constitutional democratic system and bring back authoritarianism, which in the coming years will take this country seriously back. Okay. And uh, Professor Jidofa Debe, let's talk about uh, the implications for Nigeria. People are actually saying that, look, for northern Nigeria, for example, where Bene um, Niger Republic actually yeah, shares border with us, that we should be worried for our security. Uh, while some others are also worried for Niger, that, I mean, they come here to buy food and so many things yeah, yeah. over there, so they don't know how the country may cope. Uh, yeah, so, what do you make of what the future yes, holds? Yes, I think it's also the perception that the Nigeria was leading the onslaught. Um, if you look at, for example, our, our president is currently in France, and they are, the sentiment there is anti-French. Yeah. So, it kind of bolsters the feeling that, uh, you know, ECOWAS is being used by the West. And you saw the shuttle diplomacy of uh, Blinken and the others, uh, which clearly people felt, you know, was linked to you know, at, at a point pushing, trying to push ECOWAS to take military action. It's not just about one side gaining, because there's a trans-border, big trans-border trade. The, we can call it informal trade, but it benefits, you know, very si both sides. And if it is true, what we read, that the sentiment sometimes that we are burning Nigerian flags and all these things, it's also going to affect the perception of Nigeria on the other side. So it is something, and in our own geopolitics, you have seen some people from the north also complaining. Yeah. So we should, we should be very careful. I'm, I'm not too sure I agree fully with Prof that uh, these are just military adventurists. If you remember, Babangida did say that it's media people and the general public that create the conditions for the military to come in. Mm -hmm. They tap into the public mood. And across the country, even in Nigeria, there are these strong perceptions that liberal democracy as practiced, has failed. It's failing. For, or it's failing. It, it's <laughs> because failing. you can't say it has yeah, failed. It's failing. Let's say it's <laughs> failing. If you ask yourself, for example, about our election, what should be the core purpose of election? Leadership selection. And you ask yourself, do the elections lead to selection of the type of leaders you know, people want? Do people's votes reflect, do the outcome of election reflect what people you know, voted? The answer is, you know, depends on well, who you when ask. it comes to the military, the people don't have a choice, <laughs> so we can't really rate them. But, Prof, I'm actually interested in knowing your own uh, view about the implication for Nigeria, considering our relations with Niger over the years, and then, of course, the sentiments from the north over time that look, President Tinubu should use his influence to lift these economic sanctions against Niger because it's hurting the peoples of both nations, specifically from the north. 
Well, Nigeria and Niger has had ve have had very good and fraternal relations over the years. And I think in our hour of need, Nigeria, Niger stood up to defend Nigeria. During the Civil War, France put a lot of pressure on Niger to uh, recognize Biafra. Niger refused and stood its ground. It's the one big decision they were able to take against uh, France. France. Uh, you have a border of 1,600 kilometers. That's huge. And you have relations on both sides of that border line. I think it's important to preserve that uh, relationship. And that was why when the issue of military option was placed on the table by ECOWAS, a lot of us in this country came out and opposed it. And if subsequently President Tinubu and ECOWAS softened down on the uh, military option, it's because there was a lot of opposition to it. Because you, it's easy to start a war, but once you start it, the consequences will continue for years and for decades, and there will be no winner. Everybody will lose. Mm. So it's important to preserve that relationship. I feel even now that this has happened, there are massive risks for these countries in living ECOWAS. And I think backdoor diplomacy should be taken seriously to resume that discussion, to make them understand they are really, really putting, taking a big risk com in confronting Algeria when they have so many Algeria-based terrorist groups op uh, operating in the three countries. That will lead to increasing the supply of arms and ammunition to these terrorists and will lead to a complete a blow up of the uh, security situation in the three countries. So I think they are being rash, they are being irrational, they should calm down and reflect of the imp on the implications. Just as we in Nigeria said we don't want war with Niger and our neighbors, they should also be very careful. They can confront the coastal states to their south and at the same time confront Algeria to their north. They are headed for trouble. Yeah, but uh, just before I bring in Prof, I just want to talk to you about this issue of the big elephant in the room here, which is President Bola Chenubu. The accusation is that he's too close to France for comfort. Uh, he had helped to install some other presidents in the past within this French control region, like former President Alpha Kunde, who is now late and all of that, and some other president that Chenubu had helped before the French. Uh, uh, supposedly helped him to power in Nigeria too and he's now mm -hmm. the chairman of ECOWAS and people are saying that even right now President Tinubu is in yes, France yes. at the moment so this is affecting Nigeria's Perception. relations and perceptions what's what's your view before we well go? I've not seen any evidence that France helped President Tinubu to power. There is no evidence well, that's, to that's that. That's the thinking within some and circles, actually. We need to actually. ask ourselves whether we know why he goes to France so often. It might just be like they have very good cheese. Maybe he likes <laughs> cheese. <laughs> I don't know why he goes there all the time. But I think the assumption that he's in Macron's camp is really, there's no proof of that. And I'm leaving my mind open. When I see evidence, I will then take a position. But what's important really at this point in time is that France has found itself in a position where these three countries, including Guinea, have abandoned France. They've chased them out. France has been humiliated. And it's given the context of mobilization of people in these countries against like France. Right. France is no longer a player in this uh, <laughs> region. They've been pushed out. Yeah, Even the <laughs> Americans abandoned the French and negotiated quietly with this uh, military. And they have maintained their bases. Yeah. So that shows that well, these people are not fighting Niger. imperialism. <laughs> they are just fighting France because they don't like Macron, maybe. But uh, mm -hmm. I, don't th I think we are trying to read too much into the fact 
that uh, President Tinubu goes to France often. I believe it's for the cheese. Oh, all right, <laughs> and I want your view on that. I mean, well, perception is reality. Mm. Your own perception is your own reality. Uh, if there is a very, very strong anti-French sentiment in this French, and you know, for example, uranium. If you look at say Niger, they, you know, they produce about seven percent of the global uranium and poverty is endemic. And then there is also thing, certain things that happen with uh, in Niger. When sanctions were imposed against Mali, they excluded uh, medicine, they excluded petroleum products, they excluded food. In the case of Niger, everything was imposed. All right. So all this helped that, uh, you know, this is not really, is they are being especially targeted and the people, at least from what we read in the press, people appear to be with the copists. And we cannot run away from that. All right. Well, President Tinubu has got a lot of convincing to do to people who hold this kind of perceptions. And of course, uh, Nigerians also have to support him. Because from what I have um, uh, gathered from your submission here, negotiation is still or should still be on the table. And you're saying that ECOWAS should not throw away diplomacy. It's just unfortunate. I think it was last Thursday that ECOWAS was about sending a delegation to go and talk to them. Unfortunately, the, the plane broke down in Abuja, and mm. they couldn't take off, only for them to be greeted with <laughs> this uh, unfortunate resolution. But we must thank you so much, Professor Jibrin Ibrahim. is uh, a senior fellow of the Center for Democracy and Development. Uh, we must thank you so much for joining us. And of course, Professor Gideo Fouadibe, is of the Department of International Relations at Nasser State University. Thank you so much for a wealth of experience. Thank you.